Welcome, Simon. Thank you. I understand that you're the curator of invertebrate zoology at uh, Canberra University and also adjunct professor in science communication. All through your love of spiders, is that correct? A absolutely. I think I'm very fortunate. I, um, I first became interested in becoming a zoologist when I was seven. And that was largely through my uncle, who was an um, animal psychologist at the University of Canterbury. And Jim, what, one of my earliest memories of Jim clarifying for me the fact that bees didn't think in English when they visited flowers. I had this concept, all animals thought in English. Um, but my, you know, wanting to be a zoologist carried on, and so I started um, doing zoology at the university and then became interested in spiders when I was 20. And what was really fortunate for me was that a year later, um, an American spider biologist came out and joined the faculty there, and I sort of became his apprentice. And so I was his, you know, student and colleague and friend. We worked together for 30 years, and that sort of put me on this path. And you did your, did your PhD in studying spiders, crab spiders? Absolutely, or? crab spiders. In uh, Borneo? No, these were in New Zealand, actually out by Birdlings Flat. <laughs> <laughs> so not quite Borneo. <laughs> not and, yet. Not yet. <laughs> and I used to... Um, I still remember, in fact, I was out at Borneo, just, uh, Borneo, I was out at Birdling's Flat. I was in Borneo recently, I was at Birdling's Flat. And I went past the patch of bush I used to collect my crab spiders for the experiments. And I used to um, go away from where all the cars were going by, and I had a big stick, and I'd shake, beat the bushes on, onto a tray and get my crab spiders. And I think for people driving by, they would see this man with a club <laughs> whacking bushes. So, they call them vandals now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. oh, they just have them taken away. So I, my, my interest with the crab spiders, and these were tiny little animals, um, about five millimetres, but my interest was understanding how they got the insides out of their prey. And I had a very, very, um, very, very cool machine. I had a, a very, I had a microbalance that would weigh down to a hundred thousandth of a gram, a ten millionth of a gram I think I should have forgotten so I could put a, a I could put a spider on that on their weighing balance and I could watch its mass decrease because of evaporation of fluids and so I record I could record how much venom spiders put into prey and how much fluid they're getting out and all this stuff it's phenomenal I just loved it just absolutely loved it and how did they get the insides out of their prey it's disgusting what they would do is they a lot of spiders just rip the prey apart and um, bathe it in digestive fluid and suck up the partially digested nutrients. These guys don't rupture it. So afterwards, the prey looks exactly like it did before, except for two fang holes. So what they do is they create a vacuum inside the prey by sucking. So it's like taking a fruit juice container and collapsing the sides. And they would suck up the fluid, mix it with their digestive fluid, then they let it go back into the prey, and then go back with some forwards mixing it up, and then finally take it all. Very, yes, very nice. I'm glad we don't have restaurants that work that way. Oh, actually we do. It's called the strip. <laughs> What's so special about spiders? I obviously absorbed, you know, obviously fascinate you, and I mean, you, you got into it very early. Yeah. Your, your interest was... I, was I, I had to write about this recently. I was trying to think, what were the influences? Mm. And I think the main thing was that it, my uncle, as well as influencing me in becoming a zoologist, also opened up the world of, of um, gothic horror films, and so I've always had a passion for Frankenstein and Dracula, and Dracula fits straight into the spider thing, you know, creatures of the night and all that stuff, Absolutely. and he didn't spider-proof his castle either, um, so, so that, it was an interest, and also they're interesting animals, they lead interesting lives, the fact that they're largely nocturnal predators, um, as I've got, you know, working with them for 30 years, anything you can imagine they'll do to catch prey. Yeah, but I always find predators more interesting than vegetarians. So what are some of the vegetarians. techniques? Let's, let's, let's explore that. Okay, some of the more interesting things. I, one of my favourite groups, um, while well, the crab spiders were my early passion. Um, and how would they catch their prey? They're ambush predators, so they're very cryptic. Mm -hmm. And they sit um, on vegetation and often on flowers. Mm -hmm. And they just sit there the same colour as the flower with their legs outstretched. And when something lands, a pollinating insects land, to get nectar, they get grabbed. So using the neck like bait? Like bait. And they don't have to do anything. It's like a, um, it's like an orb web in a web. It just sits there and prey fly in and gets stuck. Right. The crab spider sits in a place where insects visit. And in fact, I saw one of the things the crab spiders would do is... Crab spiders can only move in two dimensions, but most of their prey can fly and move in three dimensions. Yeah. And spiders can't fly. I mean, we know that. <laughs> but what they would do is if a pollinating insect came down 
and detected the movement of the crab spider or whatever and started to fly. They'd sometimes bounce up on the air and with their legs stretched out just try to flick it so that it tumbled and then it would fall back to the flower and they'd grab it. Very impressive. And so so how, how could you observe that? I mean, they... Very fast. fast. Yeah, 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 usually okay. watching yeah. and filming. Yeah. And in this, I worked on, after I finished my pitch, I worked in the States on crab spiders and these guys were much bigger and they, um, they would change colour on the flower. Depending on the colour of the flower, they could change colour. So they could go from yellow to pink to white over a couple of days. So they wouldn't be observed by the insects visiting? No, exactly. They were just cryptic. But what I found was the males, which were about a 50th the mass of the females, as adults, they only lasted for about three weeks. And they, they, don't, um, they don't really feed much because they're too busy chasing females to mate with, not worrying about food. But what they would do is drink nectar from flowers. So they, the males would. The males would actually drink nectar. And they would also get pollen on them, on their legs, and go to another plant. So they were effectively being pollinators as well. And if they got really dehydrated, because you, you say you rely on dew water in the morning, but if they got really dehydrated, they would go like a pollinating insect from flower to flower to replenish the lost water. And they'd visit like 80 flowers in an hour. So these little crab spiders just sticking their heads doing in. Pollination. Doing this. And... Um, and we found now, we found a lot of spiders will, will eat, drink pollen, uh, drink nectar, and get pollen and eat pollen. They'll get pollen on their, on their bodies and put them up and suck the insides out of the pollen so grains. all the bees dying, we might be... Oh, pollinating spiders. people, wouldn't they love that, yeah. Spider crabs. Spider hives. <laughs> yeah. so, so that's one technique, ambush. What, what are some of the The others? other one is um, vision. We, we're very visual animals, and we're so incapacitated we lose vision. And most spiders are not visual animals. They don't see particularly well. They rely on vibrational cues like through silk or tactile cues through the ground or chemical cues. But there's a group, and it's the biggest group of spiders, the jumping spiders, and they have eyesight about one sixth as good as ours. And that's a 10 millimeter animal. They have a sophisticated retina. They can see shape. They can see color. They can um, watch projected images onto a little movie screen and make decisions based on those. So they're really scary because they also provide an insight into how miniature brains have evolved. So we tend to think of animals that size as being hardwired, but they're not. They're much cleverer than we think. And you get them very common um, around houses here. It's actually an Australian introduction. And it's got eight eyes, but there's two big <coughs> bulging front ones. Like sunglasses. Are they the ones well, they're like twin headlights on a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. And you look down at one of those guys and they will look back at you and then jump on my glasses. So it's, so it's not surprising that some people are a little scared of spiders. In fact, some people actually hate spiders and they, they'll go to the length of uh, you know, annihilating them from their houses. Oh, I know. So do people have, something, have anything to fear from spiders? Well, unfortunately, humans as animals are just biased to be believe bizarre things. We're superstitious animals, we're scared of the dark, um, and w with some good reason, because we're, not, we're diurnal animals, we don't do so well in the dark, and there are things that would eat us, or used to eat us, now they just run us over. Um, and so things like snakes and spiders have always been feared, and it's also partly to do with the fact they're venomous. You know, things that can inject venom into you we don't like. We're not so worried about butterflies. People might have a phobia about butterflies, but it'll be for some other reason. Yeah. So it's an exaggerated fear for an animal that in some cases can be dangerous. There are very few spiders that would really hurt you. And in New Zealand, the only thing would be the catapo. And you just don't see catapos. They're very shy and retiring. And spiders don't go around biting people. That's just not what they do. And I, you know, don't get me started on white-tailed spiders, but I just get endless phone calls at the museum. and well, have... let's, let's put it to rest. What about white-tailed spiders? As I say, how many hours have we got? <laughs> in a nutshell. <laughs> in a nutshell. They got blamed for causing all these things about 20 years ago mm. with no real basis. It was just people turning up saying, I've got this necrotic, necrotic wound, wound and, and, and mm. I saw a white tail in the garden last week. Right. Therefore, it must be a white tail. So it was this thing that feared on itself. And, and you know, there's been very, very um, detailed studies done looking at the venom, looking at, at what they could be injecting, etc. And there's nothing that would cause those things. So they do not cause those. They are more likely to be secondary infections from mosquito bites and also um, uh, antibiotic resistant staphylococcus. And that's paralleled with situations in the States. Right. So white tails will not do that to so you. So leave them alone? Leave them alone. I mean, yes, people do get bitten because they put clothing on or they put their foot in a shoe. And, and one of the big studies in Australia said 75% found at least an obesity. 
So it's not going to do what people claim. And even recently, I think the Poison Centre in Christchurch said, we, we were wrong about the Whitehall, it doesn't. There was an editorial in the Medical, Australian, uh, Medical Journal of Australia in 2003 saying we apologise for maligning the white towel. It, it just is not true. Well, that's a great relief. It is, and I'm very pleased, I tell you. <laughs> African vampire spiders. I understand you've studied those. Yeah, it does it's sound like known. I just make these things up. <laughs> <laughs> I really just live in a cabin in Darfield. Um, yes, I, I was, I've been working in Africa for the last five years, and these were jumping spiders again, very good eyesight that would pick out of a cloud of very similar looking flies, and I say cloud because these, you've got clouds of these lake flies, they would pick out a blood-filled mosquito. From the, from the swarm? Yep, based on, when they were land, landed and, and mm-hmm. stationed, based on cues like the, the size of the abdomen and a few other things that told them it was a blood-filled mosquito, and the smell. And so their biology is very much tied into blood. The smell of blood, um, males and females both caught each other, which is unusual. Most animals, it's males try to, like us, males try to convince females that we're worthy partners, and females are very choosy, um, some with good reason. And in this case, both the males and females caught each other and make decisions on how good each one looks. And a lot of that is tied into the odours they carry of blood, which means they've been catching mosquitoes, which says something about their fitness, genetic fitness. Great animals. And and quite good for... Cutting with malaria, could be reducing the. It would be great, and you can't you can't go around plugging silver bullets like that. But it, they live in areas, and the areas that we were working have 100% malaria. So anything that would reduce the chances would be good. But again, you can't promise silver bullets. And what what about these pitcher plant crab spiders? Oh. They, they sound quite fascinating. Oh, too. that's just wonderful. I. I I'd been working in Sri Lanka on a documentary of the BBC, and I was working on actually a jumping spider that hunts other jumping spiders. And it, it, it looks like a dead leaf, or like a piece of dirt, and it walks like a baby robot learning to walk. So it sort of shakes, so it doesn't look like a spider, and then it hunts other jumping spiders that don't recognise it. And while I was doing that, I saw jumping spiders hanging around pitcher plants. So a few years later, I was in Borneo with my fellow Spider-Man, Robert Jackson, and we were looking for jumping spiders and pitcher plants. And I, would, I was sure I was seeing a flash of something moving. And I thought, oh, I'm seeing things. And eventually I pulled open the plants and there was this little red crab spider down the bottom. And it was responding to my, you know, this huge predator that was coming in. And it would dive into the water and hide under all the dead insects. And so I went back there to understand, one is how could they go underwater? Because they go underwater for 40 minutes. And I found that they um, took a bubble of air down and so they can breathe underwater for 40 minutes and just sit there until you go waiting. away waiting and then it was um, I was working with the BBC on planet earth and they were filming this research and what we wanted part of the deal of doing it was to find out what they ate so that could be part of the documentary and nobody knew and we found that they dive underwater and they catch larvae they go into the bottom of all the dead bugs and they flush out mosquito larvae so they throw, throw a tantrum at the bottom of the pitcher plant and all these larvae come out then they come around and grab them the, the, the cleverest thing they do, and a real insight into the evolution of miniature brains, is the most common thing you see in pitcher plants are dead ants. Mm-hmm. Ants fall in. Yep. And the crab spider detects an ant falling in by the vibrations, and then the ant in a couple of minutes sinks and drowns. Drowns and sinks. <laughs> in <that laughs> Goes order. down In that order. <laughs> yeah. Goes down to the bottom of the plant. After 10 minutes, the spider will go down and retrieve it. So it's out of sight, but it's not out of mind. So that animal's retaining a memory, and then it, and it goes and gets... The, it doesn't just grab an ant, it grabs the one that's just died. And now this thing's waterlogged and, and about the same mass as the spider. So it struggles to get out of the pitcher plant, and then it eats it. Great oh, story. No, no. Yes. Do, they, do spiders sometimes mimic other insects? I, I remember once seeing a, a green spider mimicking the green ants in North Australia yes. and going to the nest. Yes, they are. What the, it's funny, you take... Jumping spiders are the biggest group of spiders with 5,000 species, and within that, within that group, the biggest group are the ant mimics. And so for jumping spiders are diurnal, and so if you're out, there's a lot of things that would eat spiders that won't eat ants, so looking like an ant's a really good idea. And so you find these just incredible looking jumping spiders are actually mimicking ants. They're right down to exchanging the... Yeah, chemical, the... chemical mimicry as well as just visual. And in fact, yeah. one that I worked on in, um, in the Philippines, they, the males have these, ex- they elongate their mouth parts to fight other males when they're mature. 
and they actually what they mimic by elongating the mouth parts is an ant carrying another ant. And in Sri Lanka, that same one even has eye spots at the end to look like an ant. And they're on it to look like an ant carrying another ant. I still see how you got into these things. Yes, Fantastic. yes. What about our ant? Our, our, our ants. Yeah, our ants. <laughs> yeah, what about our what ants? What about our spiders in New Zealand? Because um, we've been isolated for a long time. Is there anything that's, that's sort of unusual or special about, about spiders in New Zealand? Well, we've got about 2,500 different species of spider. And I'm not a, a taxonomist, so I'm not yep. as savvy about that. But talking to taxon spider taxonomists, we do have very interesting spiders here. And it is, as you say, largely that isolation thing. And that the, a lot of the fauna here is very different to what you'll see in Australia. So that's interesting. And we have them living everywhere from underwater along coastlines. There's a species that... Underwater? Underwater. In the that, sea? In the sea? Yeah. Have we diving masks? Well, they, no, they, they live under kelp. They live un, and, and make little um, nests and, and seal bubbles of air, and then come out and feed during low tide. And we also have them up to um, 3,000 metres in the mountains. And I've used to go climbing a lot, and you know, you'd see jumping spiders up there. And in fact, the highest recorded animal is a jumping spider that was... They recorded six or seven thousand metres on Mount Everest. And what was that eating? Well, when they first discovered them, they thought they were eating themselves, which yeah, it wouldn't last long. Good for the species. <laughs> <laughs> and but they and they feed on a family, and I mean a taxonomic family, not like a <laughs> name family, not the, not the kids. They feed on a family of flies that get blown up by winds mm. and catch them. So science communication is your other your other passion, I guess. And and how do you bring together your love of spiders with with science communication, and, and what, what, form, what form does that take? Well, uh, you know, I'm mean, passionate as a, as a zoologist and a spider biologist, and that involves being an academic and, and doing research and publishing research. But, but a lot of what I'm involved in lend themselves to such great natural history stories. People, kids love hearing about the violence of it all. They love, yeah, everybody does. <laughs> Spiders being cleverer than we are and all that stuff. So, so a lot of what I've been involved in is also communicating through, I've written a number of kids' books, um, I've written a lot for um, popular natural history magazines and um, and also I started around that time as, as in natural history photography and happened to be reasonably good at it and so that's been a lot of what I've been able to do and um, and I've given an enormous number of talks and all that stuff of making that science accessible to a wide group and it gives people a sense of what is involved in science as well. You've had, had exhibitions in the States, haven't you, with your spider I was photography? Very, Tell me about that. Very lucky about that. It was um, back all oh, about '94. Um, there was a big, in fact, yes, I must tell you this. There was a big um, exhibition on spiders that was going to tour the U.S. for four years, and they asked for a number of my photos um, to be used in the exhibit, and which was nice. And then they'd fly me out to give talks on spiders and talks on photography, but. I guess the height of my career really is I happened to be sitting next to um, the Vice President of Marketing for Marvel Comics, and Marvel had given two million to the Superman? exhibit. Huh? Superman Comics, is that? Uh, yeah, Marvel? yeah, Marvel yeah. and, and hmm. Spider-Man. Oh, of course. Of course. Naturally. So, yeah. so when I was back in New York, I went to see the guy, because I said, look, spiders should be the next dinosaurs for kids. No, it's just dinosaurs are big, but spiders are interesting too. And um, I ended up doing a double-page spread of my photos if I was Peter Parker in Spider-Man comics. So yes, that's the thing I'm most <laughs> proud of. Um, and um, yeah. That's great. Well, I mean, if, if somebody if somebody wants to get into a career like yours, um, you know, in, 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 particular, in science communication, yep. or, um, where, where, how would they go about that now? Well, I think, you know, as, as we were talking about earlier, I mean, science communication is very, very important and it, it's more important now than say it was 20 years ago and that mm. people need, I don't mean to say the word justify what they're doing, but they need to communicate what they're doing to a wider audience too, because that wider audience is often paying for the funding and they want to know what scientists are doing and what's involved, yes. you know, successes and failures. Um, so I think anybody that's working in science can make their science accessible. I mean, going just purely into science communication without a science background is different and, and you know, you read things like the New York Times, the Washington Post, or the English newspapers, and they have fantastic science journalists that you say, I wish I could write a sentence yes, that yes, good, you know, and they yes. explain things beautifully. So that's that's a different path of doing science journalism, but yep. I, as I say, anybody doing science can communicate it. Yes, and um, and, and I guess, uh, if I could ask you, what's, what's your next project? 
Well, what I've been working on, in fact, I'm going not next week, the week after, you know, for all this work in Africa and, and Borneo and other parts of Asia and, and, and other pl- places, I've been working in Harry Harry on the west coast. So one yep. shop town south of Hokitika. I know it well. Wonderful place. Yes. Uh, just wonderful place. And the university's got a field station there, and they've had it for 30 years. And so I've been... About 10 years ago, I happened to find a daddy long legs, a native daddy long legs, where the males have... The females look like an autumn-coloured garden daddy long legs. Yep. The males have a 5mm body, 40mm hinged mouth parts, and 40. 80... Yes, 45... Huge. And 80 to 100mm legs. And nobody knows anything about them. Nobody knows no, nothing. So I've been working for the last year and a half on just, you know, like a sort of Victorian natural historian, just basic biology, like what they do... Um, and, and how they lead their lives, what they eat, how they use, the, how the males use these big mouth parts. The most extraordinary animals. I mean, and, and those long legs. And those long legs, and they're surprisingly agile animals. They run round and they um, they scavenge, and the males with their big mouth parts, a bit like a bulldozer, can break through the cuticle of dead flies and pull out the muscle, uh, the musculature, and the thorax and stuff like that. And and um, you get the equivalent of silverback males, like silverback male gorillas. You get the dominant. The, yeah, well, these guys, uh, if you lose a leg as a... I didn't know if you know this, but if you lose the leg as a daddy long leg, even when you're young, you never grow it back. But you've got seven left. Once you're an amputee, you're always an amputee, and they get down to, like, four left. But you get these silverback males that have all their legs and the biggest chalicerae, and so they're the ones that... Some, I'm sorry, the mouth parts. Okay, thank so you. They're the ones, <laughs> <laughs> they're the ones that must have successfully beaten everybody else up and avoided being eaten right. and being able to feed lots. It's a bit like you get with um, a lot of mammals, you'll get like um, elephant seals come to mind, where actually very few males ever get to mate. The, th- those ones get the prime real estate, the females are attracted to them. About, about the sexual politics of spiders, because often the males seem to be much smaller, do they not? They do, they do. They usually, and that's because females turn their body mass into eggs. And so the most extreme sexual dimorphism you'll get is, is a female will be 400 times larger than a male. You imagine if humans, it would be like no. male, male, males being mice or rats <laughs> and tapping at the ankles of potential mates. Um, and that's really what goes on. So yeah, usually the males are smaller, and again it's because the females will turn their body mass into eggs. That's probably the scariest story you've told. <laughs> it, is a, it is a frightening scenario. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. Well, thank you very much for for your time and, and uh, oh. your, your enthusiasm, it's, it's, it's very contagious. Thank so, you. Well, it's always yeah. wonderful to be, yeah. get a chance to talk about spiders. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Simon. Great. Thank you.